So, lower GI bleeding. Let's talk about it as quickly as possible. I was assigned this topic. It is terrible. Uh, so, <laughs> it is not a very fun topic to talk about, even though that TV screen doesn't work. So, it's at least it's better to lecture than it is to smell. So, I don't have any conflicts of interest at all. Dan, would you mind troubleshooting that TV? It's still not coming on. Um, so there are multiple causes of, of lower GI bleeds. That's mostly irrelevant for our purposes, but we'll talk about what the, the most common ones are. We're going to talk about the oh, and it warms up. Uh, we're going to talk about the management of those, and we're going to discuss disposition, which is the most important thing that a lot of folks still struggle with. And then we'll we'll move on to a more interesting topic after this. So let's talk about a case. You got a seventy some year old. Uh, guy and he's got GI bleeding and he comes in and uh, vital signs are okay. He's on um, warfarin for AFib and not really bleeding much more right now. What are you going to do with this guy? So we'll talk about that in a little bit. So what causes these bleeds? So there's different causes of lower GI bleeding. The most common one is diverticular bleeding. Okay. So classically, if it's painless, it's going to be diverticulosis. You can have a significant amount of bleeding from this and this is your classic well-appearing patient with lots and lots of blood coming out, okay? You can also have colitis or diverticulitis, depending on exactly where the inflammation in the gut is. This is usually painful, and very often this is what you find out if you had a painful patient that also has GI bleeding. You also have polyps and cancer, which are closely related. Um, a lot of forms of polyps will actually become cancer given enough time. And then the commonly forgotten one, which is the upper GI bleed, which is bleeding so briskly that you end up thinking that it's a lower GI bleed. So classically, they say, oh, if it's melana, it's this, and it's, uh, you know, if it's really, really bright, it's going to be this. It, it doesn't really work out that well, actually, um, because if an upper GI bleed is brisk enough and your body doesn't like to have blood in its GI tract, it will have increased motility, it'll come out bright red, and you'll be missing the fact this is actually an upper bleed. So what are you going to do? You're going to get labs, right? So nothing surprising here. You're going to get your basic labs. I would encourage you to get a CMP as opposed to a BMP, but it doesn't matter that much because liver dysfunction is not usually a cause of lower GI bleeds. Uh, get coags. You don't really need a PTT if you're really nuts about it because unless they're on a heparin product, you don't have to actually check that. A PTINR is plenty sufficient. Uh, it doesn't matter that much, though, as far as the cost to the patient. Go ahead and either type in screen or type in cross blood, depending on how urgently you think you're going to need to transfuse them. If it is crossing your mind at all that you want to give this patient blood while they're in the emergency department, go ahead and make it a type and cross. <laughs> and I would strongly encourage you to get an EKG on these folks. Now, that's going to seem really weird. It has nothing to do with the fact that it's lower GI bleeding. It's just these are usually older folks with lower GI bleeds. And a sudden change in your hemoglobin level can push you into ischemia. So there's many, many people that have been pushing either bad rhythms or actually had um, cardiac dysfunction because of sudden anemia because these folks bleed and they bleed fast. So, so this slide is more disturbing the more you think about why I chose this photo. Uh, but uh, what you're going to do is you're going to do a rectal exam, and it's not going to help you that much except for whether it's gross versus hemocult positive, okay? So if it's really, really briskly positive, that's going to change your management a little bit versus, oh, it was mostly brown stool and we, we put it on the card and it was barely blue. So this is one of my pet peeves, and this is still in a lot of textbooks. If you read the books, you say, oh, make sure that you resuscitate them with crystalloid. And I don't have a huge study backing this up, but I think you should give blood, not salt water to these folks. There's nothing that makes sense to me about someone that hasn't lost salt water and giving them a whole bunch of normal saline to fix their GI bleed. They're kind of like a trauma patient that just happens to be bleeding from a different place, in my humble opinion. Again, there is no study showing that giving you know, normal saline is going to make them worse than giving them blood. But if you're looking at someone that's got a GI bleed and you think they're hypovolemic, you should replace the stuff that's coming out of their butt. It's not that hard. Don't give too much crystalloid because it's going to artificially make that tachycardia and that hypotension that you were giving all that crystalloid a little bit better. And it's going to trick you into thinking, oh, they're fine, when really you should be getting lots and lots of blood ready. So here's a rough idea of made up Dan guidelines of what you should be transfusing these folks to. I don't think there's great evidence in the absence of active cardiac dysfunction, like they're having an NSTEMI in front of you, that you need to transfuse much higher than a 7 unless they're symptomatic. 
I want to emphasize that, unless they are symptomatic. Please do not be looking at that person that's diaphoretic and is having trouble breathing and look shocky and their hemoglobin 7.1 and say, ah, we'll repeat it in a couple of hours. Do not do that. Okay, this is really, really important. If they look bad, give them blood. It's not hard. That's why this topic is terrible. Also, you're going to consider correcting an INR so that it's less than 1.5. FFP is the closest thing to a crystal that I really want to give these people, okay? Platelets is a little bit of a softer call. Platelets are one of the messiest things that we give from our blood bank. However, if they're really low on platelets, okay, it would be reasonable in a brisk bleed. If they're only bleeding a little bit, I'm going to be okay with a, with a platelet count over 50. But if they're briskly bleeding, make sure that they've got enough platelets, and it's going to be very similar to your massive transfusion protocol. This matters more when you're giving the six unit of blood to that really, really sick lower GI bleeder, then really does it matter that much right up front. So consultants, this is another thing people screw up all the time. Call for help. There's almost nothing that I can do to fix this. And I thought about getting kind of creative with like a Foley catheter and injecting some like surgifoam all up in there rectally. I was like, no, let's not do that. Maybe I should call for help because we're not going to fix this on our own. So you're going to call GI medicine, okay? And you're going to say, I'd like a colonoscopy. And they say, we'll be in tomorrow. And you're going to say, that's fine, because it's really hard to actually do a colonoscopy on these folks. If you think that they have a lower GI bleed and they need help right now, the GI doctor is not the one that's going to help you, because it's really hard to do a colonoscopy if they're not prepped, and they're probably not going to be able to help much. So what about GI surgery? This is one that people often forget. If someone is about to die because part of their gut is bleeding, have the surgeon cut that part of their gut out, okay? It, it's not ideal, and the reason it's not ideal is that we got these jokers, IR. So if you happen to be at a shop that has interventional radiology that can get this done quickly, they have microembolization where they can take small vessels out and hopefully not infarct the bowel. That's the problem with this is you're cutting off blood supply to the gut and so depending on the center, if they're really good, it can be less than 5%, but you can have 20% or higher rates of infarction of the bowel, in which case they get to call the surgeon later. But at least they didn't bleed to death while you figure this out, okay? But IR is rapidly becoming the folks that will fix this. And then MICU for admission, and we'll talk about who goes where in just a second. So these are my totally made-up arbitrary guidelines because I can't stand it when people lecture about topics and they say, oh, consider blank and blank. Like, just I want some cut-and-dry things as rough guides, especially for interns, of this is where that person goes, okay? And I'm going to try to be as definite as possible, but there's always a look at the patient. They look fantastic. Okay, maybe you're going to bump them down a level. But please be careful with GI bleeders. How many people in this room have had a GI bleeder die on them? I have. And they die quick, okay? They don't wait. This is not a, oh, they, they hung out for nine hours. This is a, they were fine, and an hour and a half later, they were dead. This happens quickly with these folks, so do not neglect these folks. So let's talk about hemoglobin. Some of these folks you can actually discharge home, okay? And we'll, we'll talk about that soft guidelines for this, but it shouldn't be an active bleeder, okay? If your hemoglobin is less than 10 and you're coming in with a complaint of GI bleed, it's very hard to discharge that person, okay? It just isn't likely to happen. And anyone with a hemoglobin of less than 7, really you shouldn't be thinking that much about going to the floor with them. And we'll explain why in a minute. Ideally, if you're going to put someone on the floor, their hemoglobin would be higher than 10. And the reason I say that is that's going to provide you a little bit of a buffer, okay? This is something I picked up from Lou Chamillo. He, he states that hemoglobin's less than 10 really ought to go to the MICU, okay? Um, and I, I'm not quite as aggressive as he is with that, but I'm at least considering MICU on anyone with a hemoglobin less than 10. So what about orthostatics? Now, I hate actually getting vital signs for orthostatics. What I love doing is actually sitting them up or standing them up and asking them how they feel. So a subjective orthostatic, okay? I don't exactly care what your heart rate did or whatever, but if I stand you up and you say, wow, I feel like I'm about to faint, turns out you're sick. And that's not rocket science, but I don't need to pester the nurses to do it. I just go to the bedside, sit them up, see how they feel. And if they feel lightheaded, that's concerning, okay? If they're just a little bit lightheaded, that's kind of be expected with this disease process. But if they feel like they're about to syncopize when you sit the head of the bed up, stop and think about what you're doing. That person's probably going to the ICU because they're, they're bleeding more than you know. 
What about the amount of bleeding? So anybody that you're thinking about discharging home that had a GI bleed, because this is a very frustrating thing to see. They come in, you lab them up, the bleeding's almost all the way stopped, and they look fantastic. Some of these folks actually can follow up with their outpatient doctor because the bleeding's all the way stopped, and there's nothing really magical that's going to happen on the inpatient side. However, if they're still actively bleeding, it's a little bit hard to send them home unless you know exactly what's going on. Some folks with minor diverticulitis, for example, might be able to go home if they look well, but stop and, and consider it. Anyone that is briskly bleeding, you really, really should be considering an ICU admission if, if, they're, if they're really pouring out blood. What about anticoagulation? So the folks that you're looking at sending home ideally won't be on any anticoagulation, okay? I'm not saying that everyone that's on you know, anything like, like Coumadin needs to go to the ICU. They don't. However, you will run into these folks that have INRs of over 10 and then their hemoglobin's kind of low. Really strongly consider an ICU admission for these folks because they get sick quickly and it's really hard to actually get a lot of the interventions that you want done on these folks. And what about the vitals? This is one of the biggest things. Like, this is one of the main take-home points of this. If they are tachycardic, do not send them home. If they are hypotensive, they have no business being on the floor at all. And I don't really care how long they were hypotensive. I'm going to be speaking with an ICU doc. If any point during my stay, someone says, I have a GI bleed and they were hypotensive, I am talking to the ICU full stop. And the reason is these folks crump quick. You will not have time to resuscitate them on the floor if they go there and something bad happens. So here's incredibly unproven, wankerous things that you could do because really so far all I've said is you call a bunch of folks, they get to save the day, and you give them a bunch of blood. And that's most of what we do. Here's ridiculously unproven stuff that you might do if you're desperate. Okay, None of this is proven by science. I don't want to hear about it. Okay, So if, before I would just let someone bleed to death in front of me while I'm getting blood, I would be willing to throw an abdominal tourniquet on them. You are doing nothing to change the underlying process, but it's something that you could consider if you are truly desperate. Same idea with Reboa. You are not fixing their underlying problem, okay? But 10 years from now, this might be something people might do if someone's about to die from a GI bleed, okay? Again, do not do this right now. Get your blood. We're at an institution that can do this. This is if you're desperate. Something like that might make sense, okay? We mentioned TXA. Is that something that makes sense for a GI bleed? We have no idea because they haven't really done the studies. It does make sense, though. It does make sense, and it's something that especially if you can't rapidly get blood products, you know, you're out in the community and for whatever reason you're hospitalized TXA but can't get blood too quickly, it's something I would consider. It, it really is. And then there's also PCC and Factor 7. I don't like Factor 7 very much, and PCCs are overhyped. However, if you can't rapidly get FFP and someone is very anticoagulated and they're about to die, it sure is better than nothing. OK, because FFP is very slow, especially in institutions that don't have rapid uh, thawing of their, their FFP. And I put ECMO because I can't help myself. It would be a disaster in a patient like this because every ECMO circuit has to be heparinized. So you're giving them blood thinners while they're bleeding out. Really not a, a very elegant solution at all. So what are the common mistakes people screw up? Why am I having to talk about this? So if you're unprepared with blood, get the blood ready sooner than you want it. Because what people often do is they just wait until someone's about to crumb, and they're like, oh, I guess we need blood. And they're like, well, great. That's going to take you a minute. Get it ready early, okay? I'm not going to be too brokenhearted if you take two units out of the blood bank circulation by typing crossing them early, and they don't get given. That's okay. I'll live with it. I am going to be bothered if we need blood now, and we don't have it, okay? It's okay to give uncrossed if you need to. What about inadequate venous access? This also drives me nuts. We get people transferred from other facilities and they come in with like a 22 in their thumb. That's not gonna cut it. The classic is two large bore IVs and you, you really want two points of access. If you have to, put a central line in these folks. It's fun and it bills well. <laughs> <laughs> the, another thing is not correcting anticoagulation. I'm not saying every single joker that's on Coumadin needs to have vitamin K of 10 milligrams blasted into them if they look fantastic because you're really, really making people's life <laughs> miserable later on. But you need to think about how you're going to fix these problems, okay? <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of the novel oral anticoagulants don't have effective uh, ways to fix them right now. Very expensive solutions are coming. And lack of consultation. 
Call these folks before you need them. IR does not happen instantly. A GI surgeon does not get OR time immediately. GI really is going to be like a 12-hour thing before they're going to be able to do much, but sometimes they can do a colonoscopy even unprepped and snare something, okay? And talk to ICU as well. If it crosses your mind that this person isn't someone that belongs on the floor, do not put them on the floor. My rough yardstick of who belongs on the, on the floor is would you park them in D10, turn the lights off, and walk away for four hours, okay? That is what's happening on the floor, Okay, you need to be able to have someone that you'd walk away like you you'd say no one goes in this room for four hours. Turn the telly off and walk away. And if you say, yeah, I think they're going to be just fine for four hours. That's OK. Admit that person to the floor. If you're not willing to do that, why are you putting them in a place that might end up doing something like that? Think about it before you tuck people in. So case resolution, you get good IV access, get your large bores, the hemoglobin's 11, the INR is not super high. You speak with GI and say, hey, you know, I don't think there's anything to do right now. He looks pretty good. You okay with us tucking him into the floor? And they say, yes, high fives all around. Any questions? So summary, get that access, get that blood, get that patient better.